it comes in at a higher cost. I know we've suffered sometimes with cheaper products and copying of our textiles, which I wear, um, and, and I've seen that. So the, there are measures we can draw on to be able to do this. And the, the Minister of Trade and Industry, I think they've already been looking at some of these measures to be able to... So don't worry. Within the WTO principles, there are certain provisions that we can use to help us do what we need to do. But I just want to refer to one thing. I know what you're getting at. Free trade has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but it has also left some people behind. So there's no doubt that there's inequality. Not everybody has been lifted up. There are poor people within rich countries, and there are poor countries in parallel with rich ones who have not benefited from trade. This is why we are very keen at the WTO to support women entrepreneurs we have something at the International Trade Center called She Trades, which aims to support women to improve their trade and get into the value chain, regional, national, global, and regional value chains. Uh, um, the micro, medium, and small enterprises, Nigeria is actively participating right now in some uh, negotiations that are ongoing to reach an agreement on how we can better support micro, medium, and small enterprises. These are economies in Africa. Many of them have informal enterprises, have very small enterprises. So if we can do that and pull these areas, these marginalized and excluded areas, we'll also be helping with inequality. And that's one of the things that is attractive to me at the WTO. Now, the next question was, given challenges, how can Nigeria leverage on the AFC TFA? without being stifled. I think Nigeria is already 19% um, of Africa's trade is from Nigeria. It's slightly under a share of the African economy, which is about 25% to a quarter. So we should ex produce, exceed, reach that and exceed it. So we're not doing so badly. Um, I believe that uh, Nigeria can compete within the 1.3 billion people markets that we have in Africa. And uh, if we're able to uh, export this much into the continent, I think we should, we're able to try more. I don't know about being stifled. Um, you know, competition, uh, <clears throat> after that period in which you've been able to develop your industry, which is available to us under special and differential treatment, we should be able to compete with other countries and even outcompete them in certain areas. We are doing that already, and we should build on that. We have a vast potential. For instance, there's a strong demand for our fashion on the continent, but we've not yet managed to harness it. Can you imagine what could happen if Nigeria was able to do that? So I don't know about being stifled. I think we can leverage on what we have now within the economy, the talent we have to produce more and export more. Um, do we have to improve our infrastructure to make us more competitive? Absolutely. We have to. Um, but that is not for the outside world. It's for us to improve our infrastructure and logistics. You ask how will, how will the Dangote refinery, which is the largest in the world, impact AFCT, the African continental free trade area and, and Africa? Well, it's the largest refinery. I wish we had done it years ago. If we had done it earlier and encouraged Alaji Dangote, who is doing a very good thing, uh, we could have, it would have been better because by now we would have been able to have our own oil refined here and uh, not having to import. But we are where we are. Um, and, and I think you'll be able to service other countries on the continent. I mean, his cement industry is already in 16 or more countries, so he'll be able to export. But the one thing about the refinery and so on is, as, even as in that, and we're using it and exporting, we also have to start looking at the horizon, where many countries are now moving to electric cars, and many developed countries where cars are manufactured or not, have said that from 2025, I think Norway said 2030 and on, they will no longer, they are banning any cars that use petrol. Diesel is already out. So we have to start transitioning this Nigerian economy 
into other areas where we'll be able to create jobs and earn uh, our foreign exchange. And that's why I spoke at length. If we don't start, we will find ourselves at the end of a couple of decades with no way of being able to earn additional foreign exchange for some of the products we need. So as a country, we really have to go into strong reflection. We have a period of transition. How are we going to use it? So that is one of the things we face. So yes, it's great now, and we congratulate him, but we have to start thinking, how do we transition from fossil fuels? And I'm really worried about that. We need to have a game plan to get there. Now, um, is WTO concerned with the exchange rate regime? Um, yes. <laughs> WTO has one of the agreements on balance of payments. Um, and Nigeria has certainly invoked this uh, to be able to, um, you know, conserve foreign exchange. Um, it's invoked this article. Um, but some other members have brought a complaint against us that we shouldn't have used uh, this article in that way. So, yes, the WTO is concerned about uh, foreign exchange, the way we manage it, the way we use it. And, and how we, uh, you know, use it to support manufacturing or import and export in our economy. Um, and uh, I think we're in discussion with them about the, the complaints or about our exchange rate regime. And uh, we'll try to explain Nigeria. I shouldn't say we because I'm now DGWTO. <laughs> and it's for Nigeria to explain, the Honorable Minister and uh, our representative to explain to the WTO and the, those members complaining why we are doing this. But eventually, I think um, having a strong exchange rate and being able to phase out of this, I think we'll be heading in that direction. We're also going to see the governor of the central bank, and we'll undoubtedly discuss some of these issues. Now, the last question is about the intellectual property <clears throat> agreement trips and the argument of some members that they want to waive the trips in order to have access to medicines, vaccines, and therapeutics. Now, you know the sentiment behind this request is a very genuine one. Uh, it is a sentiment that when we had HIV AIDS, the medicines were so expensive that people on this continent were not able to afford it till almost 10 years later, where we were able to get manufacture of generic drugs. And so many people died in the interim. The next thing was H1N1 epidemic in 2008, 2009, where rich countries bought up all the vaccines, leaving none for poor countries. And eventually, they didn't even use most of them. These things hurt. They hurt developing countries. So for that reason, they are requesting this waiver of this trips agreement during this time of public health emergency so that any country can manufacture. So we really understand that. On the other side of the equation of the TRIPS agreement is the fact that it tries to preserve the incentives for the private sector and for governments to invest in research and development to produce new drugs. Some countries have invested $6 billion and more, billions and billions, and some companies to get vaccines, got them so fast. So the other side is arguing that if we just waive intellectual property rights, what is the incentive for us to now go and develop new medicines? That's their argument. What I have urged is that we have talked about something we have called the third way, which is what people are looking at. And I said we must walk and chew gum. Right now, for vaccines, if we get a waiver of the trips, we'll not be able to produce one single dose. I've been in the vaccine business now for the past five or six years as chair of Gavi. So I know a little bit about that business. You need four to five years to get a factory, a plant approved or more to produce vaccines because of the delicate nature. So um, I said, but we need them. So let's focus on trying to increase the volume of manufacturers now. For those countries in emerging markets and developing countries that have some capacity that can be turned around to produce more vaccines on voluntary license, like India is doing at the Serum Institute. They're producing a billion doses. Why can't we do that? 
If South Africa has some existing capacity, why not? There's some in Senegal. I'm actually advocating that Nigeria should start looking now at establishing the manufacture and production of vaccines for the future. This is not going to be the only pandemic. And we don't want next time to be looking around for where we are going to get. Right? So let us focus on very pragmatic approaches on increasing volume whilst we are still discussing the trips. Because for the next pandemic, we now need to look at the flexibilities under the trips and see whether it will be sufficient so that next time we are not arguing, developing countries can just produce. So walk and chew gum now, and then down the line, get the agreement. That's the way I'm going. Thank you. I'd just like to appreciate the chief of staff to the president, a man you only see and you don't hear. <laughs> so for the first time this afternoon, he has uh, exposed himself to the media in the state house here today to support <laughs> our own DG. I also want to thank the ministers in the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. Thank you for, for coming to support the DG. The Permanent Secretary, you're welcome. And especially, Madam DG, thank you very much. You didn't have much time, but you still elected to talk to the press. We quite appreciate you. are welcome. We wish you all the very best in this assignment. Like the, Mr. President said, he knows you are going to make Nigeria proud. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice.